Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice podcast. It's so great to be with you. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, psychotherapist, author, and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. A conversation is about what matters most in our lives, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Today in this episode, I talk to Minda Zetlin. She is the author of Korean Self-Care, and she writes highly a popular laid-back leaders column in uh, Inc.com. Her articles and workshops offer research-backed advice to help ambitious people get the most out of their careers and their lives. Additionally, she is the author or the co-author of several books, most recently The Geek Gap, a former president of the American Society of Journalists and Authors, and she lives in uh, Washington. And um, you can go to mindazetlin.com, find her. But today, we're going to actually talk about um, her latest book, Career Self-Care. Career Self-Care. Um, I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. I really had a lot of great, great, great insight on reading her book and talking to her. Subscribe to this podcast. Tell others about this podcast and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and connect with me through website, fujongzane.com or any of my social media. And uh, I'd love to hear from you. So without further ado, here she is, Minda Zep. <laughs> Hello, Minda. Minda Zitlin, how are you? I'm great, and I'm so happy to be here and talking to you. So nice to have you. Um, we're going to talk about your latest book, The Career Self-Care. And I totally need it right now. I'm not feeling well. I put myself through it. Like I, Minda, I started like three new projects all at the same time this week. and um, And then I also got the shingles vaccine, and then I got a cold. And I was like, what am I doing to myself? And then as I was going through your book, I'm like, oh, I should have read this book before. I was going through with self-care. You talk about, um, first of all, before we go through your book, what got you to want to write this? Well, uh, you know, the experience that you just described is an experience that I have had too, um, several times in my career of being, of overloading and dumping a lot on myself and not taking into account the fact that I'm human and I might get tired and I might get sick and I might not be peak efficiency every single one of my work days. So I needed this book. Um, in fact, I think it, it, I said in one of my taglines about the book, this is what I wish I'd read 30 years ago. So um, we're in the same boat as far as that goes. Uh, the book came about because I've been for more than a decade writing a column on the Inc. Magazine website, Inc.com, and I was writing uh, almost daily, so I had to come up with many, many different topics to write about, and I did. I've written about pretty much everything you can imagine that has the slightest association with entrepreneurship or business, and the nice thing about writing online is that you get to find out very quickly in real time what your audience is drawn to and responds to. And I found as I was doing those types of stories, I was really getting a lot of response and by way of a lot of clicks and shares on stories that were about being more productive, being more mindful, uh, thinking about work-life balance, and in general, looking at your life and your career from um, a strategic and a high level and a, level and a holistic big picture point of view. And, you know, I think it's, it's natural for writers. If you find yourself writing lots and lots about a topic, you think, oh, this should grow up into a book someday. And um, now it has. Wow. That's beautiful. You talk about self-care as a radical act, not just like, you know, just something that has been put in the 
in the closet and sometimes we go back and look at it. Um, and then you talked about how you started looking at like taking one day off to work completely and then resetting priorities and figuring out how to be with the emails and kind of doing this gradual change. And it seems like that would work better than somebody that just says, okay, from tomorrow, I'm just going to do something like really off where we might not be, you know, it's like one of those diets that you do <laughs> two days or a week and you're like, I can't do this for a lifetime. But you said that you kind of started this whole process slowly, but surely. So shifting it so that your life could really take the concept of taking care uh, seriously and systematically and, um, you know, it can be sustaining. Yes, although I actually love the idea of a self-care crash diet. Um, I, I think we should all do that. <laughs> I think it would be very sustainable. But um, so let's uh, take half a step backwards for a second and talk about what self-care means, because, you know, it has a reputation of being scented candles and bubble baths and massages. And um, I love all those things. <laughs> I do all those things. Well, I do bath salts, not bubble baths, but same idea. But self-care is really about, to me anyway, um, recognizing that the person doing the job, the person having the career, the person having the family life, is still a person, a human being, who needs rest and exercise, nutritious food, relaxation, amusement, entertainment, and needs to be at all times, as much as possible, healthy happy and at ease. And that a person who is healthy, happy and at ease is better at the job, is, does better in their career, does better in their family life and their partnership in every way. So self-care is really important for all the things we want in life. We want success. Well, self-care has to be part of that, strangely enough, which is why we put the words career and self-care together in the title. Um, so I say it's a radical act because it it's getting better, right? I mean, there's I'm not the only one. There's lots of voices out there in the wilderness with a similar message about how we combine work and life. But traditionally, in this, especially in the United States, in this Puritan-based society that we have, right? Everybody brags about how much they work, how hard they work, how little sleep they got, um, how they go straight from working all day to uh, get up early the next day and go hike up a mountain, which is a great thing to do if that is your form of relaxation and pleasure. But so many of us are so driven all the time that we almost don't know how to stop and relax and take care of ourselves. I mean, sometimes even I get wrapped up in lots and lots of things to do and go from one thing to another long enough. And I stop and I think, I've forgotten how to relax, but then I do. <laughs> then I then I make sure to make some time to relax so I can remind myself what that's about. I remember when you said that that um, right after I got licensed as a marriage and family therapist. So it was a long, long years of you know going to school and then getting prepared for you know doing my three thousand hours and then getting prepared for the licensure and all of that. Right when I finally did the exam and I, um, I said, that's it, I'm just going to go. And I called one of my friends, and she's also a much of a go-getter. We got this hotel in Carlsbad, right beside the ocean. And then we both went into the hotel room and we're like, um, now what do we do? <laughs> it was hilarious, Minda, because we said, okay, let's go get some food. And then we went getting food. And then came back and started eating and there was a ketchup. And I was like, okay, we're both are going to go get ketchup. And one is like, why don't you just rest until I get it? No, no, no. We're both are going to go. And at one point, I think two to three hours after, we started laughing at this inability to actually sit and relax. Like even when we got, when we had the intention, we created the context and the content. Okay, we're in a hotel right beside the ocean. We don't have anything to do. It's going to be three days. We had to get busy about constantly driving and going back and getting food. And we started laughing, knowing that we had no idea. You, you just said we had no idea how to relax. 
and even getting relaxed had become a chore. <laughs> promised myself that, you know, I'm going to learn how to relax. So it was this like, you know, uh, going through the process of this urge that comes, okay, let's go do something. And it's like, no, just like, just sit. And then they're like, let me read something. He's like, no, just relax. It's really a training, Minda. Yes. And I, I have to admit that I probably would be reading something if I was, because I, I, that's, I read all the time and I consider that if, I, if I'm reading for pleasure, relaxation. But it's, it's true and it's funny. And at the same time, it's sad, right? Um, you know, I mean, I have recently spent a lot of time in France. Some part of my family's from France and they have this word flané, which is just like wandering, strolling. Um, it's in this, this list of words of happy for happiness that exist in other languages and are untranslatable. Um, and now sitting in a cafe, wandering around, even living for long periods of time without having a real job, things that are unimaginable to us as Americans. And I think it's great that we're all so driven and we all care so much and we're passionate about our work, but we are in danger of forgetting how to relax, just like you described and like occasionally happens to me. And we go on what's supposed to be a relaxing vacation and it takes us a while. I, I'm, I'm guessing that after a little while you transitioned into it and then, and then you were good. It does, it takes um, a real adjustment to go from that, okay, what am I doing next? What am I doing next? All right, all right, to um, I'm on vacation and I'm supposed to just do what I want. And it, you know, even now, even today, um, this week, I recently with the launch of the book, um, this period of the year is when everybody in the region where I live has all kinds of events because the weather is dependably beautiful. Um, so between my social life and my work life, things have been super crazy. and. Days and days ago, I said to my husband on Sunday, yesterday, um, I want to just do nothing. I'm going to do nothing. And then sure enough, it got, and I did have to do a little bit of work because, you know, of course, <laughs> there was something that needed to get done. But nevertheless, I got to the end of the day that I promised myself I was going to do nothing, feeling very guilty that I hadn't gotten more done. I didn't get enough gardening done. I didn't get enough exercise. I didn't um, do any cooking. So it's really hard and it's really hard to let up on ourselves. And that's why I say it's radical because it's as difficult as it is and against our nature and our society as it is, it's also really necessary. And the surprising thing that I discovered um, is that it, it's actually better for your career and your work to prioritize that kind of rest and relaxation and self-care. Um, it's counterintuitive, right? We all think uh, Elon Musk said um, in a commencement speech I saw the other day, well, it's just simple math. If someone's working 50 hours a week and you're working 100 hours a week, you're going to get twice as much done as them. Well, no, no, you're not. <laughs> Maybe if you're Elon Musk, you are, but almost no one else will get twice as much done in 100 hours of work a week than they would in 50. In fact, it's high. research shows they will actually get less done. Um. I know that when you were talking about the guilt, it feels like we only become guilt-free in relaxation when we're so exhausted that we can't move or we're sick. And then it's like, okay, well, I can come up with an excuse that I don't have to. But you're so accurate about we are so used to not giving ourselves that time or get, seeing that I deserve that time and that it's good for me that um, it's running on everything. You also talk in your book about disappearing lines between work and life and other aspects of life. And I think I was realizing that, you know, even I put my hobbies, things that I enjoy, somehow around my field. So ultimately, it still feeds the same concept of the career. You know, it's not like, OK, I'm going to go completely do something else. Every other aspect of hobbies or the socialization or people that are around me are still, or or me and my friendships have even turned into projects, you know, doing some kind of project mm -hmm. together, which has to do something again with the field. It's interesting how I was realizing how I've brought, you know, I've chosen this passion and, and this career, and then my passion has gotten me to get take my whole community 
and bring them into this aspect of the career versus, you know, having this, and I, as, as I was going through your book and the disappearing line, I'm like, yes, all lines just disappeared. And they're all like this vast aspect of career that is, you know, it's, it has socialization in it. It has uh, trips in it. It has vacationing in it. It has everything in it. Like I was even looking at, oh, I want to go to all of these places in Europe. Ooh, look, I can go while I'm having a conference there. And it was again disappearing all of these pieces. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, you know, combining things are beautiful. But I realized how much I was extending this aspect everywhere versus, you know, uh, creating different variety of things in my life where I could really, really enjoy. Can you share a little bit about this concept of disappearing line between work and every aspect of life? Yes, and that that's so, I mean, what you just said is so fascinating and it's got me really thinking. Um, I have a, a thing that I do where I send out a daily text to people. If, you, um, if you're, you're putting my web, a link to my website somewhere, you can find it there. But anyway, um, and and there are, the texts are always like sort of thought exercises or challenges or things that people can think about. And what you just said is so fascinating to me. I'm definitely going to text about it. But um, so let's actually, let's talk about what you just talked about. Now, when um, I wrote about the disappearing line between life and work, I meant something slightly different. And I would love to dive into that too. But I'm so fascinated by what you just said, because I think it's highly common, and I agree with you that there's nothing wrong with that. So you got me thinking about the fact that um, when I'm relaxing, all right, I'm a writer, so I spend my entire day living in the sea of words, swimming in swimming in the waters of words. And when I am off, I am highly likely to be reading, um, to playing word games, <laughs> doing um, cryptic wordplay crossword puzzles, um, and to me, and I agree with you, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's my orientation. That's what I'm drawn to. Um, and I have certainly combined many a, a trip on business and pleasure. You know, I mean, I try to make sure that the business gets done and then there's a, a week or so to relax. But, um, and I don't, I agree with you that there's not necessarily anything wrong with that either. Um, you also touched on something which, isn't as true for me, but it seems to be a societal trend, which is that more and more uh, our friendships are formed through our professions. Um, there was a time in, in the history of, of this nation, and I think you know maybe others too, but certainly in the history of the United States, where uh, our circle of friends tended to be people who lived in our communities. Um, increasingly, our circle of friends are people that we work with or meet professionally. And that has its, that's good in many ways. I mean, I think it contributes to everyone's careers and people understanding each other. It's um, bad because I think it, it contributes to our society being in silos. You know, if you don't meet your neighbor who, um, you know, say is a farmer or a dog walker or has different political views from you or whatever, um, it's easier to stay in your own bubble. So I, I don't think that part of it's great. I don't think it's necessarily great for opening up um, opportunities for people who traditionally haven't had any or people trying to come in to professions from outside because people have friendships then they tend to you know then they tend to hire their friends give business to their friends and so forth so that part's not great but it is very true that our those of us who love what we do are off so-called off time often is very involved with what we do and i think um I think it's really interesting. I don't think it's necessarily bad. I also think in my experience in my life has been that often when I go off and do something that seems completely disconnected to my work, somehow it finds its way back to my work or my work finds its way to it. And I wind up writing about it or it winds up helping me do my work better. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, I recently took up singing, which does nothing to do with writing, except that it had a lot to do with teaching me to be confident and trust my own voice and be comfortable um, standing up in front of people. And so that 
came back to help me in my real profession. So, um, so, so that's, <laughs> that's kind of a long riff on what you said. Um, you know, I think maybe my, my favorite example of this was Steve Jobs, who, um, as you know, his, his, his adoptive parents struggled to put him through college, which they had promised his birth mother that they would do. And he went to a few semesters and then he dropped out, but he still continued taking classes, only now he was just taking classes that struck his fancy. And he wound up in a calligraphy class, which is something he, he talked about a lot. And he was really taken with the beauty of the calligraphy which didn't at the time seem like it had anything to do with anything that might be a career path for Steve Jobs, except of course, when it came to designing the Mac, all of a sudden, all that information about calligraphy went into the design of the fonts on the Mac. So you just never know when an outside interest is gonna turn out to actually be very relevant, <laughs> even if it doesn't seem like it should be. Yeah, I took on singing. That's why when you said that, I'm like, hey, I took on some fasts and singing and it was, amazing because it really connected me with who I was in my inner power and it was beautiful and I think that's probably recently is the only thing that I had done which had completely had nothing to do with my field. Shelly you said that, that what you had in mind about disappearing line was different can you share with me and our audience about disappearing lines between work and life? I, I absolutely will, but I, I just want to take a quick detour first to encourage everyone in your audience to do that kind of thing, like taking up singing a musical instrument, um, a language you've never spoken, because there are actually proven brain benefits to doing that that will help you um, help your cognitive function now, help your cognitive function through your whole life. So this kind of stuff is really great to do. So what I was talking about when I talked about the disappearing line between life and work um, had less to do with vacations and, and hobbies, although I think your take on it is, is really, really interesting, um, and more to do with the fact that, especially with modern technology and especially in the modern workplace, it seems like we're never completely at work or not at work, right? If you're not at work, you still have your smartphone in your pocket. You're still uh, checking your texts, your emails, um, your latest sales figures or whatever. I, I know I am. I'm guilty of this. I mean, I'm the career self-care author and I'm still guilty of this. Uh, that's why people have this practice called phone stacking where a bunch of people go out to dinner. You will put your phone on the table and the first person to look at their phone has to pick up the tab for everyone else. Uh, great idea. <laughs> I think it's uh, very, very clever. So no matter where you are, no matter what time of night it is, you have your smartphone, you probably have your laptop sitting on your kitchen table, um, right? You have your, your Apple Watch or my, um, my uh, Fitbit Versa, which is also a smartwatch. So, and I bet everyone in the audience and you and I have occasionally been, you know, at one or two o'clock in the morning, finishing up something that was important while home, while we were probably supposed to be sleeping, right? So our work lives really creep into our home lives. What's interesting, particularly since the pandemic, uh, but even before, is that our home lives are also kind of creeping into our work lives. If you think back to the workplaces of even 20 years ago, um, not all that long ago, right? There was like, you shouldn't have, you should never take a personal call. You should be dressed professionally, seen professionally, not let your emotions flow over um, and be an entirely workplace professional person, at least in, in knowledge jobs, um, while at work. And that's eased up a lot, right? I mean, pe there's people don't dress the way they used to. Uh, Inc. every year does a list of dog-friendly workplaces. Well, of course, welcoming dogs into a workplace is a very clever thing to do because then the people working there don't run home to walk the dog, right? They've already got the dog so they can come back to work so you get more hours out of them. Very smart. Um, Kid-friendly workplaces, all this stuff has kind of arisen to allow us to combine life and work. and. It can be both good and bad. Um, it's very bad when we don't feel like we have that ability to completely step away from work. And we, we all need that. Um, it, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to be a bit more ourselves at work and to bring our dogs or whatever. But sometimes 
we really need to be able to say, okay, I'm not looking at a single email today. This, by the way, is something I have never managed to do myself unless I was somewhere off the grid, in which case I worried about it for a little while and then I would finally fully relax. <laughs> if you want to really relax, go off the grid sometime. <laughs> Yeah, you reminded me that through the COVID, since all of my clients went on most <coughs> on Zoom, leggings have become my best friend and flip flops. Mm -hmm. Funny now that I'm going to the office like one or two days, I have to completely have another attire um, to to wear because when I'm home, only the top man. Right. <laughs> but always a comfortable legging with a flip flop. Um, so it it has really disappeared uh, in in that way, uh, completely. Yeah, it it really has. It's and and I'm actually wearing stretch pants with holes in them and um, my old worn out Crocs from from the waist down. So I'm only presentable from the waist up. And that's I, I have a friend who does a lot of of online public speaking, and then after after every talk, she takes a selfie of herself with her you know pajama bottoms and posts it on LinkedIn. <laughs> Um, which I, I think is great. Uh, yeah. And also, as you say, I mean, one of the things that happened with the pandemic is that, um, you know, unless people were working with backgrounds and sometimes even if they were, we all got a chance to look inside each other's homes, right? And we got to see each other's babies and each other's pets. Um, I, I have a cat bed. It's right off camera, right? Just to my left, right here. Um, there's not a cat in it at the moment. And you know, I think it's the best thing on my desk, but uh, all that stuff is kind of becoming combined. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think it's probably a good thing, but I think the, the important thing is for all of us to kind of be aware of it so that we can make deliberate choices about how much we let our work lives into our outside of work lives, because it's very easy, it's very insidious, and it's very easy to let the work-life stuff take over. It all seems so urgent and important and, oh, must deal with this right now. And ultimately, that, that isn't healthy and it won't get us where we want to go. Everyone, carry your self-care. Minda, Minda, Zetlin. Find your happiness, success, and fulfillment at work. So... Linda, you talked about also creating your own tribe and community, um, because obviously we are living in a community, but I think when you're creating an intentional community for yourself, um, it really is beneficial. In some aspect, you talked about a mastermind group and how to, you know, get people who can really boost um Kind of like have a chemistry with your intellectual and emotional space where you can run ideas with each other, they can support each other's ideas, support um each other in a way that you could be um you're not alone. The, the the struggle you're taking, whether it's on a personal level or a work level, it doesn't feel alone. And um it's one of the most important facts that we could have in the area of self-care. Because a lot of the depression and anxiety that shows up is because we we think we're the only one who's going through this. Or I don't know how to do it and it's in front of me. Um, and then we go through the anxiety of how do I do it? Where do I go? And sometimes by talking out loud, we uh, talking to somebody else's ears, talking to somebody else's eyes, talking to somebody else's heart. Um, it alleviates a lot of the stuff. We actually brainstorm and we hear ourselves and we expand. And then we, if we don't have a skill, other people can give us those skills. Can you share a bit about um, owning, or creating, bringing together your own tribe and community? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to because this is so incredibly important. Um, in my book, I write about blue zones, which are a few... Um, specific locations around the world, Sardinia and Italy is one of them, um, Okinawa and Japan is another, and <clears throat> there's uh, Loma Linda, California in the United States. Um, there's a few of these places around the world where it's highly common for people to live well into their hundreds. 
and researcher Dan Butner, boy, I hope I said his name right, I'm not sure. Anyway, went around to these zones to study what it was that made them all um, similar. Why are these people living to be into their hundreds? And so what he learned, a lot of it is what, you know, the same thing that your doctor or your mother would probably tell you, right? These people eat lots of vegetables, well, duh. They do a lot of walking. Um, they remain physically active throughout their lives. Uh, all that stuff is definitely part of um, part of the picture. But then he found another really interesting thing about all of these zones. Uh, he found that all these people were in these very tight knit communities. That community actually improves your health and lengthens your life. And there's <clears throat> more research than his that shows that that's true. Um, in Okinawa, they have groups called moais, which are groups for common benefit. People are brought together, I guess, when they're children and throughout their lives. If somebody has a windfall, they share it together. If somebody has uh, an unexpected bad event, um, they all help each other. And these people typically live to be very, very, very old. Um, being in community is so important not only for our careers, but for our lives, for our sense of well-being, for our health. Um, there's just there's just no there's nothing perhaps that's as beneficial because humans evolved to be tribal. That is who we are. So um, I think it's extraordinarily important for everyone to find their tribe, and um, ideally uh, a tribe of people that you meet in real life. I know a lot of people have online tribes and I think that works too, but ultimately the true um, benefit I think comes from at least some of the time seeing the other members of your tribe in person. Um, in my own life, I've participated in various communities that have been incredibly supportive and inc incredibly helpful to my career. Um, I've a long, long time involvement in the American Society of Journalists and Authors, which is about a thousand professional writers who absolutely help each other with everything. And I don't know what my career would have looked like without ASJA because um, almost every good thing that's happened to me has, including the publication of this book, has come around to somebody that I met or a contact that I made or something that I learned through ASJA. So I guess I would have had some sort of career, but it wouldn't have been this one if uh, ASJA hadn't been part of my life. Um, on a different plan, uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, my husband and I actually moved here in part to become part of this community of musicians that's here. My husband is a professional musician. Um, they get together, we get together all the time to make music and jam and talk and be friends and have been doing that for years and many many times when members of the group have run into trouble um, everybody shares when someone has a great gig everybody gets invited when somebody runs into trouble everybody helps um, including us uh, there was a point a few years ago where uh, our very closest friend was in the hospital dying so we were spending most of our time in the hospital uh, the rental place that we had, our lease was about up. We had bought a house that we needed to move into. We were trying to balance those two things and it was difficult enough. And then I got a raging oral infection and it needed surgery that I had been trying to put off because of everything else. But I got to where I was in so much pain that I couldn't function anyway. And I said to my husband, I, I don't know what to do. We can't, we can't move if I'm having the surgery, but we have to move. And he said, well, we have friends and he put out a distress call and these musicians came over to our house with their pickup trucks and their vans and they packed up our stuff and they moved us uh community is such a powerful thing it's such a powerful benefit if you uh don't have community in your life make the effort to go out and find a community that fits you and i guarantee you there is one out there that will fit you Sometimes we have community that is for our pleasure and fun oriented, and sometimes we have a community that we could tap into for when we need something. Sometimes they're the same people, and sometimes they're different people, and that we could tap into the different people. You're also talking to, um, as a self-care, the ability to communicate. 
the communication. You used to talk about the art of communication. And you give um, tips in your book about how to talk to anyone at any time. Um, and why do you see that? I mean, please share with us what your tips are, but also how come you've chosen this topic as a part of the self-care? Because I think it's a very important factor for self-care, but I want you to share yours. Well, I, I mean, this is how I usually talk about it. It's a superpower. And let me um, give you a very concrete example of what I mean by that. Uh, so uh, right before the pandemic, right as I was selling this book and about to start writing it, um, I went to the TEDx, I live near Seattle and I went to the TEDx Seattle Women um, Conference. And I met uh, a former IBM executive, very successful speaker named Shalmina Abji. She also was actually seeking to sell a book at the time. And I was seeking to do more speaking and I liked her and we clicked and we became, I, I wouldn't say we're really personal friends, but we sort of became business friends, if that makes sense. And we've gotten together a few times and shared tips, helped each other. Uh, I gave her a lot of advice about how to get into book publishing. She has given me advice about speaking and even let me practice some of my presentations on her. Um, she's a fantastic, high-powered, charismatic speaker, and I'm so glad I have her in my life. And um, recently she said to me, gee, it's so, so it's such wonderful luck that you and I happen to connect at this cocktail party. And I said, yes, it really was. And that was a big fat lie. It was not luck at all. I was, um, because me at a cocktail party is like a guided missile. Um, I, so I went to the cocktail party. So the first thing I did was take care of my human needs because I was really hungry. So I found some food. But then once I had done that, I was wandering around the crowd and kind of thinking, okay, who would I like to meet here? And I heard Shelmina talking to some other people and I, I immediately was drawn to her and I thought she was fascinating. And I'm like, I'm gonna meet that woman. So I sat down and I just um, bided my time because you can't, you know, other people are in a conversation, you can't like dive in. But if you were standing or sitting next to them, um, sooner or later, you are sort of gonna get included. They'll be, unless they, if they're having a private conversation, then, you know, that might be different. But if it's just a casual cocktail party conversation, Sooner or later, they will kind of invite you in or you'll find an opening to throw in a comment. And that's what I did. And pretty soon I was part of their conversation and pretty soon the other people wandered away and it was just me and Shelmina getting to know each other. Um, I did that 100% on purpose. And you can too. It's this business of talking to strangers, which by the way, talking to strangers is how the world gets better. We all need to communicate with people we don't know, especially in today's polarized world where we're all separated into little groups and enclaves by social media and everything else, we absolutely need to learn how to talk to people we don't know and have never met. That's important for all of us. The reason it's a superpower is that that ability to walk up to someone you don't know and start a conversation, that's how I got my agent. That's how I got Shalmina. That's how I've gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work over the years it really will up your game tremendously if you can do this. And it's hard if you're not accustomed to doing it, but every time you do it, it gets easier. So, um, and if you want, I can, I can run through my very quick tips for how to start conversations with strangers, if you'd like. Please, yes. Okay, so the very first thing to do is to start with a mindset that people do want to talk and interact. Now, will that be true 100% of the time? No. You will occasionally encounter people who don't want anything to do with you. You can usually figure that out very quickly. And once you figure it out, okay, move on to someone else. Um, don't let it wound you <laughs> because their, their desire not to talk to you, uh, you have no idea why that is. And it probably has nothing to do with you. Uh, but most people are actually welcoming of conversations with strangers. This is triply true if you are in something like a cocktail party or networking event or someplace else. But it's true even in um, even if you're riding the bus. Uh, they did an experiment where people were forced to talk to strangers when they were riding the bus. And the big surprise of this experiment was, first of all, the strangers were always happy to talk, even though the people in the experiment didn't expect that. 
And second of all, the people in the experiment had a better bus ride talking to strangers and they didn't expect that either. So I totally encourage it. So the first thing is expect, expect that they will want to talk to you because most of the time that will be true. Um, then start by focusing on them, right? People like to focus on themselves. So if you're at a conference, um, are you having a good conference? What did you think of that keynote? Um, whether, uh, you know, it's a cliche for a reason, whether it's something we all experience together in the same way. So, uh, gee, it's a beautiful day. Oh my God, I didn't realize it could get this cold. Uh, you know, um, all those things, good openers. Um, another way to start a conversation with a stranger, which is slightly unexpected, but extremely effective, is to ask them for a piece of information or a small favor. Uh, this is something called the Ben Franklin effect. And you can either Google it or read my book to figure out exactly how this works. It has to do with resolving cognitive dissonance, believe it or not, it's a brain science. But if you ask someone for a small favor that's easy for them to do, that will make them like you. In fact, it is likelier to make them like you more than if you do them a small favor. Um, it's counterintuitive and yet it's true. So, uh, could you tell me what time the next presentation starts? Could you save my seat for a minute? Um, I have to go and I'll be right back. Um, could you help me reach that thing on a high shelf? Easy for me, because I'm short, so <laughs> that's, a, that's an easy one. Um, could you tell me if you've heard of this person who's speaking, whatever. Um, small favor, in fact, so effective that a colleague of mine at Inc. Um, observed somebody using this Ben Franklin effect at a car dealership, a very smart salesman. Um, he, he watched him approach a couple and say, oh, could you please hold my clipboard for a minute? There's this oil spill on the floor and I need to clean it up. You know, I want the place to look good. So they held his clipboard, he cleaned up the oil spill, and then they naturally fell into a conversation about what kind of car this couple wanted to buy. So he got done with the couple, they went off, and my friend observed the guy spill a little bit more oil on the floor so that the next person who came in, he could ask the same question. Here, could you hold my clipboard please while I clean up this oil spill? Um, and he said it worked to start a conversation 100% of the time. So if you would like to start a conversation with someone, um, ask a small favor, it's incredibly powerful. Walk around with a mazola or something. <laughs> yeah, that's it, right. Well, <laughs> you don't have to mess up you know, your environment, but yeah, asking a small favor. Um, another thing, if you want to talk to, if you, there's a particular stranger you want to meet, uh, you know, the boss of uh, another department that you would like to move to, or um, a client that you would like to sell to, something like that, where you know you're going to, there's going to be someone around that you would really like to um, start a conversation with, do a little bit of homework read their blog. Everybody has a blog. Everybody has a social media feed. You can go find out what's on this person's mind very, very easily. And then you have A, a natural way to start a conversation. And B, you can let them know that you are paying attention to them. And attention is the most important commodity we have. And they will feel flattered. So I thought that was a really interesting blog post you wrote about um, the market forces shaping our industry. I'm really curious how you came up with that insight. Or even, you know, I had a different perspective on that uh, that I'd like to share with you. Something, but when you let somebody know that you have been paying attention to them, that is a very powerful way to start a relationship. And it's a great compliment because you also want yes. one of them to be give a compliment. It's one of <clears throat> One of the biggest compliments to give people when you've already paid attention and you've read up on them and you were interested in knowing them. Yes. And research has also shown, strangely enough, that no matter how insincere it might seem, uh, no one is ever immune to flattery. So never feel hesitant about complimenting or flattering someone. It will always work. <laughs> Just about always work. Um, you know, we're uh, kind of close short on time, but I really want to talk about this part of your book too. You talk about dealing with toxic people, you know, narcissists, manipulators, passive aggressive, and anger mongers. And um, 
the learning how to deal with this, it just takes a lot of the drama out, let's say, and opens up a lot of time because you're not, you know, you're not dealing with the drama externally because you know how to deal with it and you shorten that concept. But then sometimes it's not just when we're dealing with people externally. After that, we deal with this internally going on and on and on and on about all this, you know, experience we've had. So if we could deal with them shorter externally, hopefully we could also deal with them shorter internally after we're done and we're no longer there. So can you share a little bit about these uh, four elements? Yeah, so um, so I did uh, talk about four types of toxic people. Um, I think there's probably a lot more, but I call that four types in my book, uh, narcissists, people who think only of themselves, uh, passive aggressives, uh, people who find ways to uh, make you crazy without seeming to, <laughs> um, I guess I could put it that way. Um, anger mongers, people who just let their tempers or their apparently short tempers kind of control everyone around them. I think we've all known someone like that or had someone like that in their lives. Um, and manipulators. And manipulators can be very insidious people who get you to do what they want you to do in a roundabout sort of way that you might not be aware of. Um, and so there's probably a different approach for each of these if we're limited on time. I don't know that we, we want to dig into um, those specifics. But let me just say a few things um, in general about dealing with toxic people. And if we want to get into specifics, we certainly can. But um, so in general, uh, often if someone is toxic and they're really getting under your skin, the ideal thing is to somehow get away from them. Um, that could mean moving to a different area, finding a different project to work on, uh, getting a different boss somehow. If it's your boss, I think a lot of us have toxic bosses. Um, the, that often is the simplest and most effective way to deal with a toxic person. Now, that doesn't mean that if you move to a different area, there won't be another toxic person there. There very well might be. But different people push our buttons in different ways. And you might find that it's someone that you can deal with better. And if it's not, you know, then they, you can go find plan B, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> um, Another way to deal with a toxic person that is much, much harder, certainly won't always work, but can be incredibly effective if you can make it work, is to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction and befriend the toxic person. Um, most people aren't born toxic. They become toxic for a reason of their particular experience or circumstance. And often if you get to know a toxic person, um, two really interesting things will happen. The first is the more you understand this person, the less they'll get under your skin, the less upsetting their behavior will be to you because you'll understand where it's coming from. And the more you can understand something, I think often um, when it comes to interpersonal relationships, the easier it is to deal with. Uh, you'll also learn you know, what their triggers are and how to avoid those triggers as you get to know a toxic person better. Um, the other thing that can happen is as you befriend a toxic person, um, a lot of toxic behavior, and you know more about this, a lot more about this than I do, but it seems to me that a lot of toxic behavior has at its roots fear and insecurity. And the more you befriend a toxic person, the more they start to trust you, the less fearful and insecure they may feel when they interact with you. And therefore, some of that toxicity might lessen or go away, just naturally, because it's part of a defensiveness that they won't feel as much like they need. So it can be hard to befriend a toxic person. It certainly won't always work. Um, it's sometimes a good thing to try. And the last thing, um, I think this is really important. I tell a story in that chapter chapter on toxic people about some very toxic behavior of my own. Um, I think that in the right circumstances, all of us can turn toxic. And I think that if we remember this about ourselves, it can help us understand and deal better when we see toxicity in other people. 
Very much. Um, another thing that I just wanted to add is don't take it personal because people are going through their own stuff and they're going to play their own game. Um, whomever it's in front of them. And you might be just one person who's in front of them, which gets them to play their own game. So it's almost like, you know, to, there's a boxer who's in a boxing ring and boxing. And when you get into the boxing ring, they're going to box with you, whether you like it or not, because that's what they do. So sometimes it's not taking it personal. Because when we take it personal is when we now go home and really, you know, turn it into an internal conflict with, with, with ourselves. But I love it that, you brought it up and, and you know, we could look at it and see how, um, and also to look at it and see how many uh, people or us ourselves, what, how many we, how many of those behaviors that are toxic we do in our relationships and to be able to shift them, to be able to be aware of them and shift them. I think it's a very, very important um, element that you brought in order to live uh, a happy life and you said you know at the end it's really your job to make yourself happy you're absolutely right it is your job to make yourself happy and these are in this book you will find a lot of great exercises career self-care from Minda Zetlin find your happiness success and fulfillment at work and uh, it certainly is um, your responsibility Minda in one minute, if you could um, share with us something you really want everybody to know and we haven't really touched upon. Yes. Um, so the last chapter of my book is about happiness and making yourself happy. And um, I invite people, if they want to, to start with that chapter when they read the book. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson said that no du duty is so underrated as the duty to be happy. And I really love that Gretchen Rubin, who studied happiness enormously, um, was the one who told me about that. And her research has shown that uh, happier people, happier people are better people in the world, right? So if you want to do better at your career, um, happier people are better bosses, by far better bosses, and also better colleagues, and more productive, and often more creative. Uh, if you want to be a better partner or parent, happier people are better partners and parents. Happier people are better civic citizens, uh, more likely to vote, more likely to contribute to charity, more likely to volunteer, less likely to commit a crime. In every way, making yourself happy makes the world a better place. And it's our responsibility, all of our responsibility, to try to figure out what makes us happy and then do that. Min does that, Len, everyone. Where can they find you? Uh, so the best place to find everything is www.mindazetlin.com. Um, I actually don't think you need the www. Don't know why I said it. But anyway, mindazetlin.com. And you can find my book. It's also on Amazon. It's in bookstores. It's pretty much everywhere you might want to buy a book. Um, my ink columns are on ink.com. But my website is one place where you can find all the different things that I do. It was a pleasure to have you. Well, me too. Thank you so much. And for all of you who are with us, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.